I know it's just a few days since the last one, but I'm back already. So let's check out another 10 little known DOS games. Aberon is a top-down vertically scrolling shoot em up, and I have mixed feelings about it. But we'll circle back to the issues I have with it later. Storywise, after 300 years in exile, humanity finally comes back to Earth to reclaim it from the aliens that took it over in the past war. Our fleet may not be big, but our spirits are high. Especially that you're the one we're sending back to defeat the aliens come and regain control of our homeworld. And you never failed before. On the first glance, Aberon is your everyday shooter. No different than anything else you've tried in the genre, but there are also some small notable differences. For one, it only gives you one life and offers no continues. So what you see is what you get, and if you die, you die for good. But you can save between the levels, so you don't really have to restart the game from the beginning each time you play. Then there are weapons, which are purchased for credits collected from special defeated enemies. Nothing new here. But each has a different cost, and if you have more than one purchased, you can switch between them. Also, nothing out of ordinary. Some of them can even be upgraded by buying them more than once. Keep in mind, however, that credits cannot be hoarded, because if you have 10 and pick another, the counter will reset to zero and you'll be rewarded extra points for the high score. Which is fine when your ship is all geared up, but could be disappointing if you didn't manage to arm yourself as well as you hope you would and see them go quote-unquote to waste. All of that, while novel, is generally speaking okay and something to get used to. But what I don't enjoy about Aberon whatsoever is that some of your shots are so small and bluntly colored that it's difficult to distinguish them from the background at times. I mean, sure, it's not the end of the world as it's enemies' shots that are the most important for you to notice to survive, but I like to have that visual feedback to fully control the on-screen action, you know? Fortunately, I'm me and you're you, and it's you who's going to save the Earth. So if you don't mind this little nuisance, you should really give Aberon a try. What is one ton? It's what the scales show when your mama stands on it. Bazinga. I know, cringe, I'm sorry, but that's the extent of the jokes that you can expect from me. Anyway, one ton is also a tiny arcade action freeware title, and when I say tiny, I mean it. It's just like a dozen kilobytes or something. You could fit hundreds of copies of it on a single floppy. I don't know why you'd do that, but you could. It's also not a game that will keep you entertained for hours on end, as it's proportionally captivating to its size. So 2-3 minute stops is what I'd expect to take out from it if I were you. In one ton, you're strong. Strong enough to lift one ton and wield it as if it weighed nothing. And your goal is to crush as many people in one go as you can with your wanton weight, creating puddles of undisclosed red liquid everywhere. It's definitely not blood though, it's jam, I think. Anyway, the button slash plunger on the right summons a human when you press it, so preferably do it quite a few times to fill the screen, and then you get to crush them. And that's it, really. No scores, no thank yous, no game overs, nothing. Just you and the little folks and a sea worth of jam. Like I said initially, 2-3 minutes is what it's worth, around as much as I spent covering it here. So, if you happen to come across one ton, give it a go, for shits and giggles, but if you don't have it, I wouldn't recommend wasting your time searching for it. Black Zone is a sci-fi futuristic action-adventure platformer. There once was a town like all others, thriving, full of life and peaceful. And then came the aliens, a story you've heard on this channel more than once today. First, the alien ship hovered over set town menacingly, covering it in its gloomy shadow, then the streets filled with alien machines moving about in an unknown purpose, and finally, as fast as they appeared, aliens left, leaving empty husk of a town behind. Quiet, desolate and eerie. Expeditions were sent to it to figure out what happened and what changed, but none ever came back, leaving more questions than answers. Eventually the town was left as it stood, decaying and forgotten. But when the army and science fails, what do we do? When all means of study and examination bring no results, what do we do? And when no one comes back from a mission of questionable success chances, who do we call for? You, that's who. So, you'll go into the titular black zone, the area where the desolated city stands is called, and we'll try to uncover the secrets of inhabitants' disappearances. Black Zone is a flick screen platformer with adventuring elements. To complete the game you will have to reprogram the machines that's in the city using omnipresent control panels to modify their behavior, so to open barriers, move platforms and such. You will also encounter various anomalies like odd harmless alien creatures wandering about, spatial warps, gravity manipulating machines and others. It's a game of puzzling and exploration at heart, and as such there will be no real enemies for you to defeat. 
you're here to learn what happened and reopen the city for entry. Even though Black Zone is only using EGA presentation, it looks pretty nice for what the chip was capable, and you're never really feeling as if the graphics were taking you out of the experience. Same can't be said about the sounds and music though. First is sparse and not great, the latter is okay but a bit slow, better suited to putting you to sleep than being played in a background of a video game. It would work great in an elevator, is what I'm saying. All in all, Black Zone is not a bad game, but it's definitely not for everyone. Slower paced gameplay and lack of action may not be fun for many, so approach it only if it looks and sounds like something you'd enjoy. Kingdom of Sorinor is at constant unrest. Six clans have been fighting with each other for control for years. Wars are expensive, however, both in terms of supplies and men, so now they mostly use mercenaries, hiring them to ambush and assassinate high-ranking members of opposing clans and protect their own. You're a leader of one of such mercenary bands. I mean, you may be an accountant, administrative clerk, subway employee or even a mall santa, I have no way of knowing, but in the game you lead a group of deadly sellswords, completing series of offensive and defensive missions. I should say battles really and not missions, so yeah, battles. So, before each encounter you hire mercenaries which may come from all fantasy staple races like orcs, dwarves, humans or even humorous races that you won't get to see in any other game, like defense lawyers. And yeah, I shit you not. All of them have their own statistics, skills and abilities and cost money in upkeep. And since you're working within a budget for each battle, you have to compose the best mix for anything and everything that you may face when it starts. When all that's done, brew a cup of hot Earl Grey tea and send your men onto the battlefield. Battles take place in real time and you can control your units around the map, sending them to strategic or engaged in combat locations. You can also issue more direct commands of waiting, attacking or ambushing among others, but this can only be used on groups and not individual units. If you're a regular of my channel, ambush at Sorinor may seem like something you've seen before. And you're not wrong, we've spoke about a little game called Siege in one of the last episodes of 10 years of early Windows gaming. Ambush at Sorinor was made by the same developer, Minecraft Software, and shares many common gameplay mechanics with Siege. So if you like that one, this one's definitely something you should track down and play. It's worth pointing out that if you do enjoy it, Ambush at Sorinor includes a built-in map and scenario editor, prolonging its stay considerably. RC2 is a top-down single screen puzzler in which you control a smiley face and have to use it to puzzle your way to the exit of each of the numerous increasingly more demanding stages. To complete the level you have to collect all keys and then reach the exit. It's not as straightforward as it sounds though and each stage features obstacles. Some are animated while others are static. Those that move usually follow predictable patterns so they can either go straight and turn 90 degrees right every time they reach something that stops them in their way, or there are those that actively go straight ahead towards the smiley face as soon as it gets in their sight. Some are not aggressive per se and just multiply blocking the passages if left with an open space next to them. There's more obviously but listing them all here would serve no purpose and would rob you of sense of discovery when you encounter them first. Static obstacles are likes of stones, walls, water and laser cannons among others. There are also one-way passages, but they're hardly obstacles, more like an element to the puzzling to figure out when to use in the correct moment. There's no time limit in RC2 and you can save your game anywhere, though upon loading you start the particular level from the very beginning. RC2 is perhaps not the best puzzler out there, but it's utterly enjoyable, especially in those more demanding stages. Despite looking like something that I could come up with graphically after downing a bottle of wild turkey on shrooms, it's definitely worth your time if you like games that will keep your noggin working in an overdrive. I'm Batman. What? No, I'm not advocating use of any substances. It was just an example, Bruce. Chill, man. Armada 2525 is a 4x turn-based sci-fi space strategy. 4x standing for extra, excellent, extremely exquisite. And that's you, my dear viewer. 4x. Armada is easily one of the best games of its kind for its time on PC, the time being 1991. There's no real story to it of any kind, it's 2525, we're just starting space colonization and you're in charge to lead us through it. Even more so, there's no tasks, winning conditions of any kind other than either preset turn limit, which can be turned off, or your typical for the forex genre conditions. And you can play in a maximum 6 player multiplayer in any combination of human and CPU players as long as there's at least one person involved. So you'll be exploring unknown galaxies, expanding your sphere of influence by setting new colonies and capturing planets, you'll exploit said planets for resources and exterminate other races so that yours could be the only one. Wow, that actually sounds terrible and like the history that shouldn't have ever repeat. 
Anyway, as you go about doing that, you'll obviously need to research technologies, eventually allowing you to customize your space fleets with around 20 different models of ships and your colonies with approximately 15 kinds of buildings. The research is divided into 8 separate disciplines of weapons, construction, hyperspace, force fields, biotech, planetology, info science and esoterically sounding psychoscience. And it's worth planning a little ahead to what you aim to get to. Combat encounters give you a certain amount of control, though you can't affect singular units and can only set formations and issue general orders. Armada 2525 sounds great, right? And you probably wonder why you've never heard of it. Well, it's not without its issues. Mainly there's no real diplomacy in the game whatsoever. You can start a war by attacking other races, but that's pretty much it, there's nothing else that you could do. And CPU has one extra option of asking for peace, which is not available to you. There's nothing else, which not only makes the game feel a bit lacking in this important department, but also pretty much makes arms race necessary from the get-go, as you have no way of guaranteeing peace in any other way. It's not a game-breaking fault in any shape or form, but it's a big omission in Armada's design, no doubt about that. So, while I have no way of confirming or denying it, I attribute this to be a part of the reason of game's obscurity. A Spitra is a top-down turn-based RPG conceptually similar to Final Fantasy, in which you control a single hero rather than a party of adventurers. The game starts with you being apprehended by the local law enforcement when you emerge from a magical cloud. Your claims of being sent by the mage LD Root fall on deaf ears and as you're just about to face the consequences, the nearby village is attacked. When you get to it, you learn that the village elder was kidnapped and being the do-gooder that you are, you volunteer to rescue him. And that's how your epic adventure begins. Much of your time in a speedrun will be spent traveling a rather large world, conversing with various characters, taking and completing quests and fighting enemies, mainly, but not limited to, from random encounters. Up to 5 of these can attack you at once and you'll have to deal with them alone. Because All By Myself is a song to which words you live by, supposedly. Anyway, in combat you can straight up fight using your equipped weapon, use items from your inventory and cast magic spells, which you will learn as the game progresses and they're not available to you from the very start. Upon victory, you receive your rewards in the form of coins, experience points and a level up when appropriate. Level up also heals you and improves your stats in a typical for RPGs progression. Oh, and I lied, but not really, only a little. If you want to define a small lie a lie anyway, then I lied. But if you give me a little leeway and agree that small lie is not a lie but just an omission of truth, then I didn't. Whatever. What I'm trying to say here is that I initially said that the combat's turn-based, which is true to some degree. It is, unless you wait long during your turn, then it will resume automatically pushing enemy turns before yours. So yeah, it's turn-based, but not really. You can obviously equip armors and weapons, visit towns, inns and shops and do everything you would have done in any other RPG. So if you're into JRPG offshoot of RPGs, you'll love it. Blinky 2 is a mediocre action-adventure title that was made using the Game Maker software, I think. It's a toolkit designed to, yeah, you guessed it right, make games. Now, if there ever was a terrible title screen to game, Blinky 2 is the one. I mean, just look at this monstrosity. It looks like something a 7-year-old came up with on a sugar high just before inevitably crashing on a shopping bag full of candy. Anyway, the villain of the previous game, Schnookwad, unleashed a sea worth of monsters upon otherwise peaceful funky forest, purple protagonist Blinky Leaf. Now, that's not something you do to a man's home, or dinos in this particular case, so Blinky grabbed the box of his favorite chocolate-covered donuts and set off to defeat the villain. To do so, however, he has to go through 16 candy-colored levels and defeat 4 even more colorful bosses. All levels are rather large and presented in this odd top-down sorta of Zelda-like perspective. Which is not bad, as it allows for injection of some basic height differential to stages design, but doesn't save the game from the awful terrible scrolling that it suffers from. In fact, I dislike Blinky 2 a lot, just because how the game feels in movement. It's tiring to me and makes my head hurt, and it's something that shouldn't have happened in 1994. On the flip side, it may be down to game's maker's limitations, so perhaps I should not be so sour talking about it. So, the environments are quite varied and interesting, ranging from forests and waterfalls through swamps all the way to the dungeons. All unique looking and featuring various different obstacles and enemies alike, which as you can imagine are all out to get you. But you did not take those donuts with you for no reason, and you projectile throw them at anything and everything, clearing a path towards victory. I don't really like Blinky, but objectively speaking other than the scrolling, there's nothing really wrong with the game. So if you enjoyed those simple action-adventure titles, it may be worth your time. Oh, and Blinky 2 was never released commercially, it's a free game, so it has that going for it. Nineteen eighty nine's Barbarian is a port of a two year older Amiga original, 
and it's a living proof that PC's EGA cards could not compare to what Amiga's chipset was capable of, and that the VGA was the step in the right direction. Anyway, you play as Hagor, a buff protein powder muncher who's on an epic quest to find and defeat the evil wizard Necron, who's coincidentally easier than some of the enemies that we meet along the way. But I digress. Barbarian is a side-scrolling action adventure and a protoplast to the whole Souls-like genre. I realize that I've made enemies now among you guys, but I said it, I meant it, and I've Batman here to protect me. And he will actually reply to all the negative comments with snarky ones of his own, and it will be things like, I'm Batman, or I'm Batman, or even I'm Batman if he gets really pissed off. So, why did I compare it to a genre so beloved that it created a magical aura of hate around itself, actively reflecting any negative comments thrown at it? Well, because it kinda is one. I mean, it features enemies that have very unique to them attack and behavior patterns, environmental dangers to which you have to react quickly not to die, and you do it by mastering the controls, to the point that you have to time your reactions to the enemy's actions to be able to complete the game. The thing is, while I said that Barbarian is an action game and I stand by it, it's not your typical one. You don't have direct control of Hagar, but use his available moves and attacks, be it with a sword or bow, by clicking on series of buttons at the bottom of the screen. I feel that it's a terrible choice as it demands your full attention and perfect timing. So exactly what Souls-like games do, at which I suck beyond belief, I must add. Is Barbarian something that you should try? Well, depends how you feel playing frustrating and incredibly challenging games, that are actually not really bad whatsoever. Just very difficult, more than they really had to be. Baron Baldrick A Grave Adventure is the most obscure title in this whole video everywhere outside of Australia, because it's the only region in which it was released as a full version. Its shower of shoot subtitled A Grave Overture as opposed to A Grave Adventure reached other regions in a limited manner as far as I know, but don't quote me on that. It's a side-view platform adventure not unlike in its gameplay mechanics to Impossible Mission 2 or Montezuma's Revenge, but different in theme. You obviously play as the titular Baron Baldrick, who is painstakingly animated, I must add, and that's not a given in games that started off as shareware and you have to search for your late family's treasure in the tombs under the castle Pidabouch. Your ancestor, Baron Lazarus Pidabouch, used to live there centuries ago and his maniacal studies of the so-called wolf magic twisted his mind, turning him into a cruel tyrant and a local villain. So, you'll be traveling the castle and its dungeons, collecting treasures, avoiding the enemies and environmental dangers all the while making sure to eat, as an adventure of this grandiose scale can easily leave a man craving for some nom-noms. After all, who could say no to a chicken, a burger or even some grapes just lying around the castle floor for god knows how long. I mean, the 10 second rule applies, right? But it's reversed here. If it's been there for more than 10 seconds, preferably a decade or two, then it's good to go. To eat, I mean. Game logic. Anyway, castles filled with various hidden switches, turning platforms and ladders on in least expected places, so make sure to touch all the walls at any time you feel like you've reached a dead end or see a platform with no obvious way of getting to. It's a neat concept, but that overused in my opinion. Baron Baldrick feels to me like an 8-bit game that was granted an early 16-bit design. Is that bad? Not really, it's just not something I would be going out of my way to find and play. By 1993, when it released, it was already looking dated on the platform it dropped on and felt like something even older when played. And that, along with limited area of promotion, contributed to its rare status today. So, weren't today's games cool? I think they were. But what do you think? If you liked the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. If you didn't, well, then there's thumbs down there too. But I suppose you wouldn't have persevered up to this point if you really didn't. Around 60% of you are not subscribed and there's currently no way of knowing if YouTube will decide to recommend you the next episode or not, other than subscribing and hitting that bell, that is. And when you hit that bell, whenever the new video is out, YouTube will actually send you a small and friendly notification about it, so you wouldn't miss it. If you'd like to support the channel, Patreon and YouTube memberships are a great way of doing so, they will help me release better content and also they get first dips on all new videos before they're publicly accessible on YouTube. If you can't or don't want to do that though, likes and subscribes are great too. I would like to take a moment here and thank all the YouTube creators from whose videos short bits were taken to serve as a background to my commentary. They're amazing and stars among the retro community. You will find names of their channels at the top of the screen when their footage is running and also in the video description below. For me though, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.